Thank you very much, everyone, for coming at this late hour. Uh, we're lucky enough to have luck. Some of you might know him from uh, Coursera courses he's teaching. So uh, he's much better in person. Uh, he's been uh, teaching here a machine learning course. Uh, I think that one of the a lot of people ask me what differentiates Google from all the other clouds. So there are plenty of things, but one of them definitely is the machine learning. We are quite uh, advanced in this field and quite investing. And part of this probably. If you've heard the TPU, TensorFlow Processing Unit, so it's a unique chip that we built for machine learning. And uh, today uh, we actually had another meetup on Tuesday about TensorFlow and machine learning end to end. And today it's a more uh, more philosophical, philosophical end right? of the week. Yeah. <laughs> uh, about how to prepare the data for machine learning because there's a lot of theory about it, but also tools. So what is gonna share it with us? Right. Thank you for coming. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. It's, it's been great being here in Tel Aviv this week. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about here, my name's Lack, right? I think uh, you mentioned it. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is probably the hardest part of machine learning, right? When, when people who've been doing machine learning for a while, you ask them, well, what took the most amount of time in your project? It usually is the data preparation, the data wrangling. The actual ML part of a machine learning project is often just a week or two weeks. Right? There's going to be a whole bunch of data preparation beforehand and a whole bunch of experimentation afterhand. Right? The machine learning theory and things that you know you, you go to Coursera and you find all these uh, you know, six month, eight, you know, two semester courses, they all focus on the small part of machine learning. But getting a successful machine learning project is often about the front end of the things that you do and on the back end, having built a model, what are the other things that you do? I'm not going to talk too much about the back end of it. Instead, today I'll focus on the front end. And what I've discovered over time is that it helps to be <coughs> philosophical about it. Right? It's one of these things about ML is that you get into this mode, the way you think is often very different. And this is something that many of us who come to machine learning come to machine learning from a data standpoint or from a statistics standpoint and probably the biggest difference between machine learning and traditional statistics is how you deal with outliers and how you deal with outliers so uh, basically right if you can if it's somewhat washed out you have a bunch of green apples here and there's one red apple somewhere in there right and if you're doing a very statistical approach what would you do with that red apple get rid of it, right? It's an outlier, you don't want to deal with it, you take it out of your data set, and you basically build your model on all the green apples that you have, right? You, the way you deal with outliers in statistics is you find the outliers and you remove them. That's essentially what you do. In machine learning though, right? Again, it's about a philosophy, right? The philosophical way you think about this is that there is no mistake in nature, right? So if you ever see a donkey that looks like a zebra, in machine learning, right? You don't say this is an outlier and I'm going to remove it from my model and I'm going to train my model on all the donkeys that look like donkeys and all the zebras that look like zebras. Instead, what do you do? Philosophically, you tell yourself there is no mistake in nature. What shows up in the data set is going to show up when I need to make my predictions. And that is a key thing, right? It's about this whole practical aspect of ML. It's this idea that what you find in your training data set, you are going to find those same things during prediction. And at the time of prediction, if somebody gives you something that is a cross between a donkey and a zebra, you have to be able to do something with it. So in, your, in our case of green apples and red apples, if we train our model only on green apples, chances are that when we actually go out and put our model into production and we start using it, somebody's going to give us a red apple and say, give me a prediction for the red apple. And we need to have a way to predict for it. So the philosophy here is you go out and you understand those outliers. And rather than discard the outliers, 
you basically say, okay, this thing is strange in my data, so I have to go collect more examples. Right? It's a, the approach that you're going to take is very different. The approach that we take is from the standpoint of we have lots of data, we're going to train on all of the data that we have, and if we find skews in our data, we're basically going to go out and collect enough examples so that we can actually train based on those examples. What does this essentially mean when you're uh, in, in, a, in a practical situation, what you're essentially talking about is that if you have something that's a power law distribution and you have a long tail, you're essentially saying that you're going to spend a lot of time and effort trying to make sure that that long tail, you have enough examples of everything you see in that long tail. So one, when we say that in machine learning, collecting the data takes a long time, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about this idea that the bulk of your distribution is going to be easy. Just the data set that you find lying around is going to have the bulk of the distribution, the typical customers. But it's a long tail that typically means the difference between a very successful ML model and something that's not as successful. Right? This is your most profitable customers will often be in this long tail. The reason that you're doing machine learning is because you want to automate the predictions for that long tail. Right? The bulk, you can often get away with a simple analysis and you basically can come up with a good recommendation for the bulk of your users. It's that long tail of users, the unique users, the rare users, the not so common use cases, that's the reason you're doing machine learning. So that's kind of what I meant by it's a philosophical thing that you've got to get into your into the way you approach a machine learning problem. It starts with how you deal with outliers. Like you collect them. You don't throw them away, you collect them. It's a very different way to way to think about it. The second principle, and by the way, I'm going to talk about like 12 principles, right? In case you're getting itchy, like how long is it going to take? Right? So this the second principle is this uh, the Buddhist saying see things as they are, right? Don't, don't come in with assumptions of what things ought to be. Instead, you basically go in with an open mind, look at your data, and see what it tells you. So you've got to see things as they are. So for example, this is something that really happened. We were looking at IRS, the, the US tax agency. So we were looking at the tax agency data, and that data set consists of the filings, the tax filing made by every charitable agency. So we have this in BigQuery. BigQuery is the data warehouse on Google Cloud. So we have this data set in BigQuery, and there, every charity gets an EIN. An EIN is the, you know, it stands for employee ID number, but it's that unique number that every organization that files a, a tax form with the IRS, that's what it gets. So we're having our data set and we have our EIN, what would you think about the EIN? It's an ID field, it's got to be unique. So we just go ahead and say it's unique, it's going to be my key, I'm going to basically go ahead and assume it's a key and do everything? No. Again, there's this whole philosophy of don't make us any assumptions. Just because something is a unique ID, just because something is a key, doesn't mean that it is actually going to be unique. So, and this is unfortunate, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story of this as we go along, right? But, so, here, so here's a query. So this query is basically on the public data set of BigQuery. So you go ahead and what am I doing here? I'm basically going ahead and looking at the entire public data set of IRS 990 filings. And I'm counting all the employee ID numbers. And I'm counting whether they're distinct. Right? So if these are really distinct, this difference should be zero and should get a count of duplicates. Okay. Now, here's the deal though. I'm going to run this query and I just ran it just before it started. This top started. Ran the query. He said it's running on this entire data set of IRS filings. And turns out the count of duplicates is, oh my god, why is it zero? Well, because I was, I sent this the deck of the stock around, and the person who maintains this data set in BigQuery saw the stock and said, "Oh no, you should not have duplicates in that data set." And so he went ahead and fixed it. 
So just to show you that actually when I did this demo, it really wasn't. When I first looked at this data set, I went ahead and slurp in BigQuery you have this capability of getting a table as of a certain date. So before they fixed it, so I went ahead and said, give me a copy of this table before it was actually fixed. So that I went ahead and saved a copy of this table. So I'm not making it up. When I run this query, you will see that actually there were duplicates in that in that table. So this is it's it's kind of a cute story, right? So just because a data set used to have duplicates doesn't mean it's going to continue to have duplicates because you start talking about it, and then the person who owns the data set says, no, nope, I'm going to fix it. <laughs> so it got fixed, but the story remains that when, when I first did this machine learning model on this IRS charity data, I couldn't assume that this EIN was going to be actually distinct. It wasn't distinct. There were duplicates. And I, that was one of those things that you had to verify. Right? You had to verify. So how did you actually, how did I actually go about doing it? The way I went about doing it was that I used this thing called data prep, where I loaded up the IRS data set, and I basically wrote a recipe. So I did not actually do the cleanup myself. I wrote a recipe that said, go ahead and remove the duplicate rows, drop certain tax periods, bring things from multiple years. Yes? Can I ask you a question? Sure. If there are several duplicates, mm -hmm. Uh, are they exactly the same or having only the same ID? Uh, in this case, they were all of the rows were identical. Right? In this case, they were actually duplicates. Yeah, you're right. So sometimes a charity could file multiple times in a particular year. We're not counting those. Right? This is this turns out to be truly duplicate rows. That was just an artifact of the way that data had been collected. Right. So it was it. it the person who created the data set told me that it was because they had multiple files and they had overlaps of the, of the changes. <coughs> yes? Um, you touched on this idea of you know creating a copy of the data, which I find very interesting in terms of reproducibility, because mm -hmm. when you just push codes to repos, one of the issues that you know, right. you the data. Can you comment on that? No, you know? Absolutely. Can I comment on this idea that you want to make copies of your data? Actually, I did not make copies of the data. What I did was that with BigQuery, you have this whole idea of auditability, mm -hmm. and you can always find the table state as of a certain date. So I just went ahead and essentially uh, you know, got the table as of a certain date. And just for convenience in my demo, I went ahead and exported it as a table. But in my SQL statement, I could have gone ahead and taken that IRS data and basically said, minus write this amount. So get me the table, do this query as of a certain date. And you're right, that is very important for reproducibility. Because this are, these are tables that are constantly getting streamed in. And if like there's a new new year, new data, new month, new filing, now all of your experiments are no longer going to be reproducible. So when you think about writing a SQL queries, that auditability becomes very important. Absolutely. That's that's cool. So the way this worked was that you would go into data prep, and let me just show you how that works. So I would go ahead and say, I want to import the data, and this time I'm going to import from BigQuery. I could say I want to import maybe something else. Let's go ahead and import like the there's a the average speeds is a is a data set from the city of San Diego about each of their highways and the speed of cars on each of their highways. <laughs> Basically, say go ahead and import this table, and notice that it gives me a preview of this table. Goes ahead and import it, and it will find. Uh, distributions of all of those columns gives me a pretty easy, quick way to explore the data, find uh, what each of those columns looks like, etc. While that's loading, let's continue here. So that's the second principle, right? To see things as they are. Don't don't make assumptions that something's an ID feed; it shouldn't be duplicated. It could. Be. The third principle comes down to just a practical nature of machine learning, right? Machine learning is a very fragile thing. People, you know, when, when people are not familiar with machine learning, when you talk about ML, they think that there are all of these very sentient machines that somehow basically are going to take over the world. And people who do ML are like, oh no, right? I know how much I have to tweak and tune and figure out different parameters and all that. It is not that sentient, it's actually pretty hard, very, very much of a, of a craft 
rather than a science, right? It's very fragile. And part of the fragility comes because most of the loss functions that we're dealing with are non-convex. So which essentially makes this what is called in computer science an NP hard problem. Essentially a problem for which you can never find the optimal solution. So part of this is that you have to set up the problem in such a way that convergence can happen, that you can actually reach a reasonable solution. So in order to do that, one of the key things that you might want to do is to basically take all of your input and, and basically take them and make them fit into a relatively small space, right? Most of the activation functions that we use in machine learning, they're all active in a minus one to one range. And pretty much all of our input variables, we need to, we need to basically take them, and in the real world, all of our inputs are all in very various scales. We might need to linearly scale it. We may need to clip things that basically go off into various directions. You may have things that are like, you know, that have, that span multiple magnitudes, in which case you might want to take the logarithm, right? So this idea is that, right, if you have variables that are way too big or they're way too small, things don't quite work. My analogy here is like a train approaching a platform, right? You want the train to stop at exactly the right point so people can get on and off, slightly off, and it's as if, right, you know, the whole transportation infrastructure breaks down. Machine learning is very much like that. So we're talking about all of these inputs and we need to basically get them into that right activation range. Otherwise, it's as if that particular input didn't even exist. And we have to do this all the time. So that's basically this idea of, right, of you want to make sure that everything is just right. So to go too far, to go beyond, is just as wrong as to fall short. And this idea of being very precise, of being very detail-oriented, that is very much part of the philosophy of doing machine learning. So that's the, that's the third principle, right? So you want to basically make sure that you are very, very precise and very detail oriented, knowing what the ranges of things are. And let's see. Never mind. <coughs> the fourth principle here is this idea of, again, like, now I talked, the first principle I talked about was that if you have outliers, you basically want to go collect more outliers. But there are some cases where that's just not going to be possible. Right? It's just that these things are rare and you will never collect more outliers. So he, in this example, I was actually doing something around flight data. I was trying to predict whether a flight would arrive on time or would arrive late. And we are basically looking at different airports. Right? And if you're looking at an airport like New York, or you're looking at an airport like Chicago, you have thousands of flights from that airport. It's not a problem. You can actually use the airport as one of your predictors. You know that flights that leave from JFK at 5 p.m. in the evening on any workday, they're gonna be delayed, period, right? So you can basically use that to build your model and it's not, not an issue. But on the other hand, in the US, you have lots of airports where they may have only right 200 flights in an entire year and now it becomes very problematic to build a model where you're taking the airport into consideration but just because you have airports that have only 200 flights doesn't mean that you cannot use airports in your model because then you lose all of the benefits of building a model for something like new york right? so how do you deal with in the real world you will have some airports that have lots of flights, you have enough data, you can use the airport code as one of your features in your model, and you have other airports that you don't have enough flights of. The basic solution is, if, if it's a real valued input, like the airport, the number of flights, what you do is that you basically do what's called a bucketized column. So you essentially take them, and you, you divide up all of the airports into buckets, right? So buckets, where you have lots and lots and lots of flights, they tend to be their own, right? Each airport tends to basically have just its own data. But airports that have only a few dozen flights from them, you start combining them, right? In such a way that you basically put 10 or 15 airports into that bucket. So now you're building a model that's an average of all of these airports. And notice that this is a better way than just throwing away the airport. It's a better way than just 
building a model for these rare airports. It's good because now airports that are rare kind of get combined with each other. And so it, some things that are, are specific to those kinds of airports. So in the US, for example, it turns out that airports that don't have too many flights, the reason that those airports are there is because they're seasonal airports. Like for example, you have the ski resort in Aspen, Colorado. It's only open in winter, right? So you don't have that many flights. But then this idea of seasonal airports are all similar to each other. So the kinds of things that you learn about a seasonal airport, what you learn about one airport is actually applicable to other airports. So it's this idea of bucketizing, right? That's part of your whole preparation. So this idea of you have examples, but they're not enough. What do you have to do? You have to make them sufficient. And the way you make those examples sufficient is by combining them with like-minded things. And you have to find those like-minded things. And that's the way you do it for real value things. You bucketize them. How do you do them for categorical things? For categorical things, what you do is something called embedding, where you basically take all of these things that are all unique and different, right, and categorical, and you basically represent them by a lower dimensional space where nearby objects are similar to each other. So that's that in TensorFlow is called an embedding column. So that's the basic idea that you take and you make your examples sufficient, right? So another way to say this, right, in a Buddhist philosophical way, is that you want to find the truth wherever you are, right? So if you are in a place that's very popular, the truth is about just yourself. But if you're in a place that's not all that popular, you don't have enough examples, then you basically go ahead and try to find the truth by looking at similar places around the world. So that's the basic idea. So that's the fourth thing. You want to find the truth where you are by finding either yourself, if uh, now there's enough examples or by finding similar examples elsewhere. The, the, the next principle is basically this whole concept of embedding again. The idea behind embedding is that you are basically trying to find objects that are similar to each other. So if you have one hot encoding, right? This is what we typically do with categorical variables. Everyone knows what one hot encoding is, right? You're basically taking your uh, taking your, it's often called factor coding from statistics. You're basically taking your uh, your object which can have say 10 values and basically exploding it into 10 columns that are either 0 or 1. But the assumption when you do one hot encoding is that value number 7 and value number 8 are completely independent of each other. You're basically assuming that these are categorical, they're very different, and therefore I can assign a different column to each. But if you do that, the size of your data set explodes Right? And you don't actually get to these numbers that you assign are typically very arbitrary. But you also want to be able to say, for example, right, that there is a relationship between, let's say you had one categorical column that was countries and another categorical column that was cities. You want to somehow be able to say that cities that are close to each other right, are and are mean that the countries that they are in are also close to each other. Those are the kinds of things, those kind of commutative properties are not possible if you basically do them without, if you're just basing them on your data set. So the idea then is that you step back and you basically look at a much larger data set. Let's say for example you go ahead and look at, so maybe you may be doing a data set that's much smaller to do your own prediction problem, but rather than build your embedding from that smaller problem, instead you basically look for an unsupervised problem, something a much larger data set where all the countries occur and all the cities occur. And if you can basically go ahead and look for all the cities and countries in that much larger data set, you will often start to find that you can actually build based on just co-occurrence of, of cities and countries, etc which countries and which cities are all similar to each other, and which countries and which cities are different from each other. Chances are that uh, a, a book or a magazine article that talks about Norway is also going to talk about Sweden. It's very unlikely to also talk about Ghana, right? And so over time, you start basically, by looking at just this co-occurrence of variables, you basically start building up this idea of closeness between things. So, the, uh, so that thing here we're talking about is you, nothing ever exists entirely alone. 
So you're not, don't think about this problem that you're trying to solve by itself, right? Be then you're looking at your data set and you're saying, these are my input features, this is my label, this is a categorical variable, I've got to one hot encode it. Instead, think about that categorical variable and where else does it occur? And go find a larger data set, even if it doesn't have any labels, it could be an unsupervised data set. By just the fact that these categorical variables appear in this much larger data set, you can essentially go ahead and do co-occurrence to come up with embeddings that make a lot more sense. That's essentially the intuition behind word to vec, for example. Right? You're basically taking words and you're converting them into vectors in such a way that close enough words are similar to each other. But the same thing is true of pretty much many problems that, that we think about. Let's say you're building something on your company's catalog. right? So you're basically saying, say, do people buy this or do people not buy this? So you, you, your first temptation might be, I have this item in my catalog and I'm going to take every item that I sell and one hot encode the, the item ID, right? the product ID. But that's a bad way to do it because now you're not making these relationships that two, uh, two of, of these items are relatively close to each other and other, some other items are very far from each other. So instead you say, okay, I'm not going to for, forget about the, this particular problem. Let me look at something much larger. And the much larger thing might be like every uh, customer email that has ever mentioned these two products in conjunction. It could be every customer invoice where the customer has bought these two products in conjunction. Right? Uh, or no, those are the kinds of things that you can look at. You can look at a much larger data set to look for co-occurrence and that helps you build an embedding that gives you, instead of a categorical one-hot encoding, a lower dimensional thing that helps you get an ML model that's a lot better. So that too is part of data preparation. Yes? Sir. Can you comment on uh, how you would relate the the unsupervised embedding with the prediction? Oh, can I talk about how I would relate the unsupervised embedding with the prediction? I don't actually do that directly. So the unsupervised embedding is just a way to represent my item ID, right? So let's say I have a catalog of 50,000 items. The one hot encoding will create 50,000 columns, but I use my co-occurrence trick to basically say these pairs of things occur together so now the label for this pair is one, and you have another pair that doesn't occur together, like, so you do fake sampling. So the co-occurrence for this is zero. So I have my new data set where every pair is either one or zero, depending on whether it occurs together or not, and then I train a model, and then I look at how my 50,000 got reduced to say five, right? The weights of those five, and that becomes my embedding, and it's a reusable embedding, so any problem in my entire domain where I need to represent my item ID, I go replace it to those five numbers. Right? And that basically simplifies every other problem down the road. They don't have to deal with 50,000 columns. They can deal with four numbers. So your, your model becomes much smaller, easier to train, and so on. So that's the fifth one, right? Nothing ever, no problem exists all by itself. It's all about finding where, where those things occur in a much larger space. So when you're preparing data, you don't think about one problem by itself in isolation. But the same idea of isolation plays into another thing, where if you look at anything, right, the nature of it derives from this mutual dependence of things. Right? So this idea is like, for example, if you're trying to predict taxi cab demand, right? How many, how many taxis are gonna basically uh, be uh, required in New York on like tomorrow. Right? So you could basically do this by the fact that tomorrow is a Friday and Friday has certain characteristics. That's one thing to do. You can use the day of the week. But you may also say, wait a second, the amount of taxis also depends on weather. So what do you have to do? You have to basically go ahead and mash some other data set. Right? The whole idea, the name of the game is to bring in relevant data sets all into one place. So this is where you want to make sure that the place where you store your data, it's not a silo. It's not like every department has its own data, and you, when you want to build a machine learning model, you can only build the data with the data in your department. You want to basically have an unsiloed data warehouse where everything can go in and you can build your models off of it. 
So that's the that's the sixth principle. This idea that you know, things derive their nature from this mutual dependence. So you want to go find related data sets, bring them in, build your model on the largest data set that you can. So the next principle comes from this idea that in machine learning, you you have to basically create three data sets. Right? You basically create three data sets. You create a training data set, you create a validation data set, you create a testing data set. Why do you do that? Well, you train you, because you want to prevent overfitting. So you create a training data set and use a validation data set to basically choose things like model parameters. Do I have enough model parameters or am I overfitting? But then because you've used your validation data set to choose your model, then your final evaluation, the one on which you basically tell everybody how well you do, that is done on this, on this final test data set. Okay. Yes. What is overfitting? Overfitting. What is overfitting? Overfitting is this idea that you're basically going ahead and fitting into noise, right? Rather than going ahead and uh, fitting the real thing about the data, most data has these very specific characteristics, and you don't want to actually go ahead and learn those because it's not generalizable. So, so it's very important when you do machine learning models that you want your model to basically generalize and do well on unseen data. So this validation data set plays a part of unseen data. Yes? Do you agree that there's a relationship between the quality of the data and the pre-processing that you do and your ability? Because, I mean, if you look at it idealistically, we want to overfit because we want a precision answer. Right. So if you can maximize the quality of your pre-processing, mm -hmm. you do want to overfit. Do you agree? So, so the question, yeah, so th that's a great point, right? So you're basically saying that if my data is absolutely perfect, then <coughs> overfitting is not a problem, right? Overfitting is not a problem the because the parameters data that you choose and the, the specific right. data points. So, so, but that also assumes that your actual the system that you're modeling is also precise. You're basically saying that if I have a customer, let's say you're building a recommendation engine, right? You're basically saying that if customer A comes to my website, right? I should always give him these five recommendations because he has done these things in the past. <coughs> Whereas we know that people's preferences change over time, it varies with their moods, there's all of these other things. So we need some amount of randomization because a past purchase could have actually, even though your data are perfect, the, the, one of the purchases that the person made was actually for their nephew and it doesn't actually reflect their preference. And you'd want to actually learn that. In your data set though, they did actually buy something for the nephew. So it's actually there and it's a truth. So, so there is this whole idea of how much, are, how much does your data set reflect underlying reality. And there's no amount of pre-processing, I would argue, that you can account for this natural amount of variability in real life. Right, so in your deal, but it is absolutely true. So we, I've done models where you're trying to model a physical system. So for example, one of the machine learning models that I built was something called an optical, uh, like optical radiance function. So this idea was that you, know, you have this model that actually goes ahead and figures out how much a light ray would get blocked if it were basically passing through a, a variety of clouds. So we're using that to simulate how a satellite image would behave. Now that is a completely physical system and once we had the model, we could actually completely go ahead and uh, train to it. There was no question of overfitting there because we're actually modeling a real physical equation, right? So that's the, so it's possible, right? If you have no such variability, you could do that. Maybe that's a longer answer than you wanted, but that's. Yeah, well, see, it becomes a, like a linear equation, but just right. with, with a huge number of variables, with you, you have a large data set. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Right. So we, have, we need three data sets. In reality, no, how many data sets do you have? One. One. You have one data set, right? In reality, you always have just one data set, and you need to split it. Right? You need to split it into three parts. The problem is splitting a data set into three parts, the way people normally do it, what do they do? They use rand, right? 
They say I'm going to basically go ahead and do RAND. If the RAND is less than 0 0.8, it is training. If it's between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9, it's validation. If it's greater than 0 0.9, it's testing. What's the problem with RAND? Every time you run the SQL query, I'm going to actually get a different result. What does that mean for experimentation? It is not reproducible. Right? I'm sorry, you could create another table, absolutely. So you could take your RAND and you could basically put the value of the RAND as another column and that way you get your reproducibility, right? But what you don't get, right, is another problem that you have. And the other problem that you have is that in most data sets, okay, uh, is uh, like, for example, in this case, I was trying to basically do something around of the predicting the weight of a baby. Okay? The baby that's going to be born, we were trying to predict the weight of a baby. The problem with doing RAND was that in our data set, there are triplets or twins. So what, what is a twin? Two babies, right? Born to the same mom, exact same gestation period, exact same everything, except it's two different rows of the data. Now if you do RAND, what do you get? Sometimes one of the rows shows up in training and the other row shows up in validation. So at that point, how good is your validation measure? This is what we call leakage, right? You have some data that is now leaked between training and validation. Between time in different time to the world. I'm sorry? Twins, when they come to the world, yes. there's different time when they come in. They come, yes, yeah, so it is actually two different rows of the data, slightly different times. What we're going to assume that is that twins are going to be born in the same month. It's not perfectly true. There could be, a, there could be one twin born on the 30th of the month and another twin born on the 1st of the month, right around midnight, but we'll ignore that possibility. And we basically say that we'll go through our data set find the month that the twin was born, right? We'll hash that and we'll use a modulo of that, right? If the modulo of that hash, if by modulo four is less than three, so 75% of my data is gonna be in training, the other 25% is gonna be in validation. What does this do now? If I have two twins born on the same day, both of them will be either in training or both of them will be in validation. Everybody okay with that? <coughs> right? By using the month, we make sure that there is no leakage between the training data set and the validation data set. I what? Uh, don't like the data. Because uh, you may claim that a woman that was uh, uh, when she, uh, she was pregnant during months, uh, during the summer period or during winter period, mm -hmm. if it was real data and real model, right. I would claim that it may affect the weight of okay. the data. Absolutely right. So you, the, the point being that this hash month, right? If, if you put all of the Junes in training, right, and they're not in validation, we have a problem. But in reality, we have multiple years of data, and the hash month is going to be month in year, so there will be enough Junes in the training and enough Junes in the validation. It's just that it's going to be Junes of different years. So June of 2005 will be in training, and June of 2006 will be in validation. I would also claim that there are more babies born in June versus December. Right, but then you have enough Junes in both, right? So you have enough June, so it, overall it's going, to, it's going to basically add up to be the same. So the idea here is that you want to basically Basically, like splitting your data, the, the common thing that you do is that I'm just going to do a RAND. RAND by itself isn't good. You have to think about leakage, and you have to think about reproducibility. So you want to basically look in your data set, find a column that you're willing to lose, and that column might be the ID column, might be something else, but make sure it's a column that you don't actually need for your data, but that column prevents leakage. So you want to think about this whole idea of leakage, and that's basically what the next principle is, right? The name of this principle, I call it, you want to basically, if you cling to something, right? So that's the thing that you can lose, right? So in this case, we're going to cling to the year month, and so we're not going to use it in our model, right? But we, it allows us
to repeatably separate right training data from validation data. This this occurs surprisingly often in a variety of different contexts. In that flight data set that I was talking about, it turns out that two flights on the same day, right, are also highly correlated, right? If one flight is delayed on a day, that other flights on that day also tend to be uh, delayed. So when you split your data, again you want to split it by day, right? So you don't want to base, you don't want flights from the same day being in both training and validation. You want to prevent leakage. And that's not to say that time is always the best split. In every data set, you have to think about what the best split is. But you have to think about it from this very systematic standpoint. Yes? How do you systematically think about leakage? I mean, what, what do you, I mean, this is like how to prevent leakage, but are right. there ways to test for it? Is there ways to test for leakage? That becomes really hard, right? Testing for leakage, essentially you're looking for columns that are very similar in both training and tests. So you're basically looking for similarity. So if, if you can find those kinds of similarity kinds of things, that's the way you test for leakage. Uh, excuse me. Yes. So if you, when you're running a, when you do machine learning and you're mm -hmm. running a, you're running a network, right. and you're trying to optimize a network for the training data set, right. So you can begin by testing your train the training network that you trained on a pre-processed on pre-processed data, right. And how how precise should you? hope to get that, I mean, because obviously you don't want overfitting. Mm -hmm. So how, how much precision should you be looking for before you go into your test data set to, for using your, is this? Yeah, yeah that, that your, okay. Uh, how good is good is unfortunately one of those things that is very data dependent. There are some problems for which a 70% accuracy is spectacular, and there are other problems for which a 99.3% accuracy is pointless. Right? Well, so you, you hope to have perfect accuracy. You, right, but you no, you, you will very rarely have perfect accuracy, right? So you will often basically, so it's a question of how good is good unfortunately, right? You don't know, and the normal thing that we recommend to people is to come up with a benchmark before you do machine learning, right? And your benchmark can often be a very simple rule, a heuristic, something on your data that tells you, okay, this is a benchmark so I know what my approximate RMSE is, and am I going to get better than that, right? So you basically come up with a benchmark, and then you come up with a goal of, say, 30% improvement over the benchmark. And that's kind of the kinds of things that you do. But it's something that very much experience driven. Is this plug and play when using Google's services? No, it is not plug and play anywhere. Sorry. <laughs> yes. You had a copy. The next think is around human insight, right? So as machine learning people, it can often be very tempting to basically say, I have all of these input variables, this is my menu, and I'm gonna basically go pick my features out of this menu, right? The things that you're given, you assume that that is the limit of what you can do. But you should really be thinking about, okay, this is the menu that I'm given, how can I combine these things? The combinations are often the way human insight works. So you want to think about how can I take two different variables and combine them to capture something true about my data set. Right? So uh, the way you do combinations is through machine learning what's called crosses, by like feature crossing. So here's this idea that in the menu, right, for our taxi example, we had the latitude, we had the longitude. We had where, where is a taxi going to get picked up? Where is a passenger going to get picked up? Where are they going to get dropped? And that was like information in the data set, the lat and long. What we did was that we went ahead and took the lat and long and we bucketized it. So we broke the latitude into pieces. And similarly, we broke the longitude into pieces. Right? And what what does that do when you break a latitude into pieces? You basically get a grid. Right? <coughs> what happens when you break a longitude into pieces? Again, you get this grid. And then if you cross the two, you basically get the block in which they were picked up. And that is a very meaningful thing because you have neighborhoods in a city. Right? And you can basically get at this idea of a neighborhood, a human insight of this idea that cities have neighborhoods by basically crossing 
latitudes and longitudes. Okay? So you want to think in terms of, don't think in terms of these raw features and hope the machine learning model is going to figure it out. It might figure it out, but it's again this NP hard problem and it's very likely that it's never going to be there. And one of the ways that you can kind of make the machine learning problem start in a good starting point is by having feature process. Okay? So you want to take all your human insights, ask your users what kinds of things matter, right? And look and ask for what they say. For example, another thing that matters in this problem of predicting taxi demand is the idea that 3 p.m. on a Wednesday is very different from 3 p.m. on a Saturday. <coughs> so you basically say, I'm going to take, make a feature cross of time and location, right? So you basically are time and the day of the week, right? And you may also want to say that 3 p.m. on a Wednesday in Midtown Manhattan is very different from 3 p.m. on a Wednesday in Queens. So you basically want to do a feature cross of the time and the location. That combination matters. And there's ways to represent combinations in your machine learning model. So don't don't restrict yourself to the menu. The Buddhist saying is, right, the menu is not the meal. Right? The menu is just a list of ingredients and you have to use them to make a meal. Right? So you basically want to think about what you combine to basically make something meaningful out of it. So number nine, yes. Does it depend on the model you, uh, you pick? Does it depend on the model you pick, right? One common misconception that I hear is, oh, if we use convolutional networks, or if we use deep learning, we don't have to do feature engineering. No, no. That is true only of certain types of models, like yeah, images, yeah. right? No, I mean, if you use, I don't know, random forest or something like this. Right. Uh, the, the model does the... The model creates a whole bunch of shallow trees in a random forest and averages them. But the trees are going to be much less biased and better if you are able to start with feature process as one of your inputs as well. Right? So again, I mean, the other thing is to always realize that it's not you versus the machine. It's not like you're going to tell the machine learning model, here's some data, you go figure it out, <coughs> aha. Right? Instead, you want to basically help the ML model come up with good answers and if you have knowledge about that problem domain you want to incorporate it so your machine learning model does better and the way you incorporate a lot of knowledge is in the form of feature process because they're they're general enough but they basically capture this idea that's very hard for an ml model which is this and condition right so you want to basically capture those and give them into your model i'm not sure if this is the same question but uh, when you're doing data pre-processing, this is another, this, my question was, if you have so many data points and you know that there's a relationship, let's say an average relationship between two data points and one given vector. Right. So instead of doing the average, mm -hmm. it seems like you could just do a depth of two, let's mm -hmm. say, right. and add each data, add the two vectors as two vectors at one data point. Correct. And giving you two entries now. Two, right. Which become then in a linear way. Two, two entries. So is it is it more efficient to do the average when using a neural network, or is it more efficient to just add, just throw in the raw data, just to add the... The average is, a, is, is, is not a great example, simply because the average is exactly what a neural network does as in its first node. But let's assume there's a more complex function. Rather than the average of these two things, what it's actually doing might be, let's say, right, taking the logarithm of one variable, right, dividing it by the sign of the other variable, and you say that that thing is a very important predictor, and you know this, you're often better off doing that transformation and making it a third input into the neural network. A lot less learning that way. A lot less learning that way, a lot more guaranteed to converge, faster learning, you have lots of benefits. Mm -hmm. So you want to take those kinds of insights and basically put them in. So number nine right, uh, is this principle that when you build ML models, you want to build them with some humility, with the idea that the world is going to change as soon as you finish building a model. The world is going to immediately change. The world is impermanent. So you want to be aware that things change. So what do you have to do? When, when you build a model on historical data, 
you go for it to production and things are different. What do you have to do? You basically have to retrain, right? So data freshness is often, in many real world problems, data freshness is a very important consideration. Okay? So you go through your raw log files, your analytics data, your assets, your files, all the historical data, and you basically go ahead, you pre-process the data flow, you, put, you have it in your data warehouse, you train your ML model, and you start serving that ML model. Meanwhile, there is new data coming in, and on this new data now, you're basically making predictions with your machine learning model, and then your users come and tell you those predictions aren't that great anymore. They used to be good, but now something has changed. Right? What, what's happened is that the data that you trained on and the data that you're now predicting on, that's called training and serving, the two things are now different. This can also happen as a bug in your code where you basically went through and you took your historical data and you pre-processed it and you trained with it and then you had to take that pre-processing code and put it into your production system so you could actually apply the same model. And unfortunately, when you took the code from your training and you put it into your production system, it is two different systems. You did the pre-processing in a different way. You have a bug. So training serving skew can happen because of a bug. It can also happen because the world changes. But either way, you have to be aware that training serving skew happens. So you have to be prepared for it. How do, how, how do you get prepared for it? One of the ways that we suggest you get prepared for it is that when you do your pre-processing, you make sure that your pre-processing code is common for both training and for serving. Okay. So you want to basically use a system that lets you do both batch pre-processing and string pre-processing. Okay. You train your model, and meanwhile, every time you get new data, you think about when should I relaunch the training. So all the time, Right? You basically are re-evaluating. So let's say you're building a recommendation engine to basically suggest new products to your customers. You also have to collect metrics on how many of those recommendations were acted upon and basically use that as the next step, the labels for the next step when you do the training. So you have to think about continuous training with fresh data. So when you build your models, you have to think in terms of how do I resume the training of my model. So you have your model, you've checkpointed it, it is the model as of your historical data. Now you get 5% more new fresh data, and at that point you decide I'm going to kick off my training again. So you've got to build your models for change. Right? And you've got to build your entire system for change. And that's the thing I think where we are very good at, at Google Cloud. There's this idea that we can, you can build a data pipeline, it's end-to-end, -end, it's integrated. What you do with training, you can basically put it into production, and you can do that all within your development environment. Yes? Just to conceptually, you made just, I think, two distinct points. Mm -hmm. One is that, you know, if you just had some model, you could rerun it on more data of the same type of data you trained it on. Right. The second point was that now that you put recommendations in, mm -hmm. you could use the data, the response to these recommendations. It's kind of a new type of data to Right. This is uh, not exactly the same thing. So can you comment on that? Sure. Okay. Yeah, the question was that when I talk about continuous training, I actually talked about the fact that uh, you, over time, you collect the evaluation for your predictions as well. Right? So in the historical data, you have the truth, and you basically say, these are my inputs, and this is basically my label. <laughs> whether the person bought the item or not. But then once you start <coughs> serving out predictions, you can actually start creating a second type of data set, which is basically when I show my predictions, right, is this purchased or not? So was this a good prediction or not? And you can basically use this to create a better model to basically do your ranking of your predictions to show better predictions from it. So this is all part of this whole loop of continuous training where you're continually improving what, what, so your first version of your model might be just based on historical data, but later versions of the model have to incorporate this more fresh data to basically get better predictions. 
in the existing networks that you have, mm -hmm. does it help when when you when you're talking when you do what you're talking about right now, where you have a new data set that doesn't fit, it's not perfect in the in the right. network. Does it help to run it more than once? Is, is that is that useful? Uh, so so basically, the way uh, our systems are set up is that you can train a model, right? And once that model is present, you can start serving off this model. You have new data. You don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to take this new data, put it with all of your historical data, and retrain everything. Instead, you can take this model, which is at one point, and train with the fresh data, and move it to a second point, which still remembers most of the historical data, but is somewhat better tuned to the fresh data. But it's only 5% data, right? You get the next 5% and you move it some more, and over time, What's essentially happened is that your model has essentially drifted to basically reflect the newer data better than the very old data that it hasn't, you know, that it saw a long time ago. So you basically have this idea that your model is constantly adapting as you're going along. In the networks that you have, the existing networks that you have, you gave the good exa a good example of this donkey maybe mixed with a zebra, right? something like this. So if you have that as one, let's say one data point, mm -hmm. if you run that many times, right? Or small, you know, you can yeah. do some small data skew mm -hmm. as a photo, let's say, just... Right, so, so the more steps you run it, the more it starts to tune towards the fresher data, and the more it starts to forget the older data. That's absolutely Oh, so there's actually loss. There's actually so loss. Correct. If you were to go back and run an original data point on the same network... It would actually perform worse, because that's perform. older data, you asked it to focus on fresher data. Is that something that you... That plan in the network or is that it, it is something that you yeah so this idea of emphasizing freshness is something that we often care about right if you're if you're doing there's a variety of problems for which freshness is very important in most human systems freshness is extremely important right the older data tends to be stale the systems have changed people's preferences have changed the product mix has changed everything has changed so the historical data was nice to have when you started the model, but the fresh data is where the action is. Is that is that a feature of the network? It is a feature of the way you do things, correct. So that's the idea, right? You do all of these things with the assumption that the world is impermanent. So three more, okay? Number 10 is faults, right? You're often afraid, right, of faults in your data. Right? This idea that, oh my God, my data has these problems. But if those problems are going to exist in your serving also, you don't want to get rid of them. Those are just things that you use to build a better model. It's like a rock climber. Right? They don't look at a rock and say, oh my God, this rock has a lot of cracks in it. Right? Those cracks are essentially the way they climb the rock. Right? So when you train your model, having this co not completely smooth thing Right? Having some amount of variance is often an advantage. It's a way to actually do better at learning a data set, at learning the things that are important about the data set. Okay? So that's the whole idea. Like, Don't assume that faults are always a bad thing. So don't over smooth your data, because that will basically make things worse in the long run. So principle number 11, right? as Google Cloud I've got to say this. right? So this is 11. The less there was of me, the happier I got. Right? This whole philosophy of letting go about things that are not as important. And one of the things that's not as important is infrastructure. Right? <coughs> Don't worry about installing software on your systems. Don't worry about running code on your systems. Embrace the cloud. Embrace serverless infrastructure. Right? You basically, you know, whenever you want to do your training, don't. Don't think about how, when am I going to go buy a GPU. Just rent a GPU for the few minutes you need to do your training and run your training job on that. Right? Let go of managing infrastructure. Think more in terms of getting your job done. Right? So forget about infrastructure. Go serverless. So that was that is eleven. So you know, less is more. And finally, number twelve. My favorite picture on the deck. So sometimes. Not getting what you want is a wonderful stroke of luck. So this is the Dalai Lama, one of my favorite quotes. I mean, as a data scientist, as someone who builds models, frustration is the name of the game. Right? 
right? Frustration is the name of the game. That's how you lost your hair. That's how I lost the hair. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Nice right? I, I used to have hair before I did data science. <laughs> I can give you some if you need to. <laughs> I'll borrow your hair. You <laughs> change some information. <laughs> right. So, but some, but really, that frustration, right? That sometimes not getting what you want is actually very good. You want to basically treat every failure as a learning opportunity. You want to basically think about what, what have you learned from doing this that you can apply to your next thing. And in fact, it's often a good idea to think about basically a different approach to the way you do things. There are two approaches to success. One approach is to be very careful, right? Basically try out a few ideas, but really go at them in a lot of depth and see them through completion, and then you basically will get some successes, right? right? It, but it takes you a long time to fail. The other approach is to say, I'm gonna try out a whole bunch of ideas, but I'm gonna cut my losses very quickly. I'm gonna fail very fast. I'm gonna figure out if something is gonna be good or not. And the way you do this is by basically looking at the most complex thing, right? Looking at the hardest problem. See, if I approach, if I do this this way, will I be able to solve my hardest problem? And if I don't, cut, cut the loss, try out the next idea, right? So this idea is that embrace failure, right? Embrace frustration, right? Get, like, basically go ahead and try things, try a lot of things, experiment very fast. So that's basically the Zen guide to preparing data for MCAL, right? So that's number 12. And basically we talked about like in, so we had the Zen principles, there is no mistake in nature, which is like, what does that mean? And then you have the more uh, easily understandable thing that is you want to understand and collect outliers. And here's a slide that basically puts them both together. So you have the Zen principles and you have the easy to understand way of doing it. Do you have a few minutes to uh, maybe show the tools like you did in the previous meetup with the uh uh, the with, with with data prep and uh, yeah, data studio, sure etc. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Even if it's by slides. Okay. Even. Okay. Oh, actually, I can. Let's see. Uh, <coughs> I might still have my. Uh, uh, actually, let me just do it this way. This is basically the thing I showed in the previous meetup, but I think uh, it's a pretty good thing because it's a very end-to-end -end example of how you go through and you do everything. So. It's the blocks and daily weight. So here is a, uh, a Jupyter IPython notebook, and this basically shows you this end to end process of how you do a machine learning model on Google Cloud. So you start out by you have your data in BigQuery, you explore it in Data Lab, you use it to basically create your machine learning data sets using Dataflow. And there are three ways, that, the way I think about it now, there are three ways to write data flow. You can do Python, you can do Java, or you can do data prep, right? You can do things visually. Next, you create a TensorFlow model. And when you create a TensorFlow model, there's a very nice something called the Estimator API that lets you write very little code, get a very powerful model. You take that model, you train it on the cloud, right? You lob it off to the cloud on lots and lots of machines using Cloud ML Engine. You deploy your model, and at that point, you can basically make predictions of the model. So the first step is to basically explore your data. So you basically have your SQL query from your, this is the baby weight example. This is the actual label, the thing that you want to predict, and a whole bunch of input columns. And then, you now you are exploring the data. You're basically looking at different distributions of various things in the data, are they good, are they bad, should I use them, should I not use them, do I have enough examples, do I have to make them sufficient, stuff like that. So you basically go ahead, you build your entire, you, know, you do all of your data exploration, and based on that data exploration, this is data prep, so you basically have each of your columns and you have the distributions of each of the columns, you go ahead and you find out, is this worth doing, is it not worth doing, what should a bucket it look right? You basically say, for example, right? You, you obviously don't have too many babies that are quintuplets and uh, qu no, four, four or five kids. So what do you do with them? You, you basically make those decisions, 
And then in this case, I'm writing it in Python. But again, you can do Java, you can do Python, you can do data prep. I basically write a little bit of code in Python, and then I lob it off to the cloud. So this is a data flow job. This code here from my notebook, I say run this code on the cloud, and it basically runs on 27 workers. Right? So I just run the 27 workers. It takes that huge data set, it's like 137 million rows. It basically pre-processes everything, and about 20 minutes later, I have my answer. Right? I have all of my data set ready to do ML. And then I'm ready to basically do TensorFlow. I basically write my code to read the data set, and then I build my model. This particular model is called a wide and deep model. So it finds sparse columns, finds deep columns, and then basically right, goes ahead and does what is called an experiment. So it basically runs a training data set, does the evaluation data set, it runs the training, it does the evaluation, and then comes back and says, okay, here is the final model. Once this model works, right, I try it out on a small data set, and then I basically turn around and I run it on the cloud for two million steps, right? I run it on two million steps on like, you know, about on a standard one, which you can think of as a cluster of say about 10 machines. Yes. The really important thing that you're saving the data from iteration to iteration on Google Storage as well. Right. Like bucketing, because this is not happening like in memory. It's not happening in memory. <laughs> this is all happening. I mean, this is 137 million rows. There's an, I'm not storing this in memory and doing this in one one thing. I'm actually doing it batch by batch, mm -hmm. two million steps, running it on the cloud, and I basically come back with a model that that is nice. It's like you know an RMSE of of one, I can, while it's training, I basically do all the monitoring, and then I basically go ahead and deploy it. I say, go ahead and make a version of this model, and once that model is created, it's now just a web service, it's a microservice, and I can pass in a JSON input. So I have a baby, male baby, mother's age is 26, Asian Indian, single kid, 39 weeks, this is my son, by the way, right? Mother married. <laughs> Segment now, you're like, what should the, what should the weight be? 7.3 pounds. That's great. Okay, I've gotten my model. But that's pretty much it, right? From one notebook, we went from data exploration to data preparation to, to building the model, trying it out, lobbing it off to the cloud, deploying the service, doing a prediction, right? I didn't install any software. I didn't go buy out, I didn't buy any hardware. It was all just rented infrastructure, just got done. So and that's the kind of powerful nature of doing things in, on Google. I think that's this, this integrated pipeline is where we totally shine. In the, in the beginning, you start off with something that make, makes ease of use. When you're using something like data prep, basically saving you a lot of time when you need to cleanse the data. Exactly. And because, exactly, right? So no, this is the very quick way to look at your data, clean it, write a data flow pipeline and then you can run it at scale. It's not exactly data flow. It's a, it runs on data flow, I can't export it. Yeah. So basically it's something that runs, but when we ran it on, the, on specifically data prep, it launched 600 servers, 600 cores. 600 cores. Yeah, and ran like it for half an hour on like data set of 200 gigabytes, I think, okay. and taking it from Google Storage and dumping it into BigQuery. So basically it's something that saved us a lot of time. Nice, nice. That's, that's the, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we want to hear from customers, right? It saved us a lot of time, it saved us a lot of effort, got things done. <laughs> Quickly, this is my Twitter ID. This is Daniel Levitt, so you have questions, uh, you know, things that you want to ask. Especially not theoretical ones. <laughs> <laughs> Practical ones, like how do I get this? Talk to, talk to Daniel, and with that I'll take questions. Thank you. I, I was talking to somebody that deals with clients, and uh, he, he mentioned the fact that security. A lot of people have the data; they have their data, and they're really nervous. They don't want, you know, it's something that it's proprietary. Mm -hmm. It's uh, maybe you know, maybe very sensitive to their clients. Maybe maybe they're under legal obligations, sure. so they don't want to just put it up into something in the cloud. You know, right. like just have it floating around up there. Okay. Like, so well, what, I mean, what, the thing the is that you security? can always put it in a bucket, and it's owned only by you. And uh, you can encrypt the data so it's readable only by you. Right? So, but I, Google, let's say Google as a corporation, would 
you have access, there's access to this oh, data. Oh man, or for me to look at customer data, not you. I have, no, anybody, anybody at Google, engineers, SREs, <laughs> it's a major, major thing. You have so many people to sign off on. There's so many security policies in place. No, Google does not look at customer data. Not only that, not only that, you can use your custom keys. So you can encrypt the data with your key. So we basically can, even if you want to, and someone signs off on it, we can't. So it's our responsibility then to choose the machine language, uh, the, the learning algorithm, the, the parameters. So, so of there's the a lot of flexibility. So you yeah. can choose a variety of things. You also have on the net on this system something called canned estimators. These are the recommended kinds of prepackaged things that work on a variety of different use cases. So if you don't want to make all of those choices, you have canned estimators that okay. help you basically. This is what this. I meant by plug and play. Right. So it's something you can go in and you can say, I need this many outputs, I have this many inputs, I need this kind right. of output. So, there, these kinds so, so the thing to look at there is in Data Lab, it's called ML Toolbox. Right, and this is basically, you, you do exactly that. You say, here is my data, right? It has these many columns. This is a schema of these columns. This is the thing I want to predict. Please predict for me. So it goes ahead, it writes the model, it trains the model, it gives you a model. Really, so this is all pre-programmed? It's all pre-programmed. It's called ML Toolbox. You should try it out. If you want something where you don't want any knobs, you just want it to be done automatically. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Oh, what am I doing if there are nulls in the features? Typically what we do is either we basically replace the nulls by something and that is something that's part of our workflow. You might replace it by the mean of the data, for example. Or sometimes you take the nulls as actually real values. It's a null, it means that we didn't collect the data. So in the baby weight example, for example, whether mother smokes or not, we have true, false, and we have none. Meaning we didn't we did collect the data, right? So that is also a valid input into the model. So you do one of the quarter and... It's not actually, yeah, it's, it's like a three, three possible uh, values, correct. Thank you everyone for coming. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.